We have people from all over the world. This is super exciting. We have ladies from all over the world. We have Kenya, we have Zimbabwe. Let us know in the chat where you're dialing in from. We have Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome this week and our last week of the year to our fireside chat. This is your weekly drone date. And uh, I don't even know what I'm going to do next week, Thursday, when it's drone date time. I am totally thrilled to welcome Dr. Kimberly Baldwin. She told me we could call her anything from Kim to Kimmy. And I can totally identify with that because I get called all sorts. When our parents called us Kim so that people don't shorten the name, people just go and lengthen it. So we live with that. That's awesome. Kim has a company called Marine Spatial Information Solutions. She is joining us today from the Caribbean. I think this is probably the coolest location. We've had anyone join us on our fireside chat. And she's a marine ecologist. And she's going to be talking to us today about work she's been doing to support environmental management in the Caribbean and beyond. So I'm not going to do you any more justice by introducing you any further. Kim, over to you. And we're really looking forward to your chats. Thanks so much, Kim and Louise, for inviting me and Sharon. I'd like to first give you a shout out. The person that actually introduced me and brought me into the whole Women in Drones organization and circle I joined just this summer and it was really an opportune time for me to learn about this group as I've been expanding my company and it is a woman-owned 100% it's just me myself and I and other people I hire along the way so it was great to get this support and encouragement in terms of understanding more about business and entrepreneurship and all of those sorts of things which is why i initially reached out amongst other commercial drone pilots that are operating not just in the united states but globally and that's the type of work that i do and it was just so nice to be able to meet you ladies and network and it's just been really great so i just wanted to just start by saying that and i also wanted to also acknowledge all the caribbean contingent i was so excited when i saw on linkedin this morning how many people from across the caribbean that i have not seen or talked to in many years a lot of it due to covid but i was just really happy to see you all so thank you for coming today today i really wanted because this is a fireside chat i wanted to keep it fun keep it informal because i don't know louise and kim and the africa side of this conversation I just figured I'd introduce myself and who I'm about, and I'm not going to start with drones. I'm going to start about what type of work I do, how I got into drones, how I got into drones about five years ago. This picture here, actually, just to give you guys some context, this is one of the projects I'm using drones for. It's for sargassum, which is a seaweed that has been overtaking the Caribbean for the last few years. It's a serious problem in terms of managing it. And so this is just a picture that was taken a few weeks ago in St. Lucia during a training exercise with the St. Lucia National Trust. And this is actually a a picture. And I'm going to talk about drone mapping more so per se, which is my focus and my specialty, but even aerial photography and videography and the fact that you can glean information, but the storytelling and the impact factor of just aerial photos from drones alone is great. It's really sexy. People love to talk about drones and see drone footage. So this is in St. Lucia, like I mentioned, with them managing the beach with tractors. And so all those weird little swirly lines in the top is actually from the tractor every day, pushing the sargassum up onto the beachfront. So that's how they're managing this issue at this point in time on this beach in St. Lucia. First, just give you a little overview about me, who I am. My name is Kim Baldwin, as I mentioned, and I was born and raised in San Diego, California. This is a picture I took just this summer out there. I went for a month, COVID style, and stayed for six. I'd been gone for a couple of years. It was great. So I grew up in California. I grew up on the beach, in water sports. I love the sea and the ocean. And I went to UCSB. And I initially started doing pre-med. And my last semester of college decided, hey, I can't be stuck in a hospital. I like field work. I like being outdoors. I like camping. I like surfing, diving. And I switched full circle last semester of college and decided to do marine biology. With zero internship experience, everybody thought I was crazy and I didn't really care because I figured I'd be working outside and be happy. 
And at that point, I got lucky and got a job in the Turks and Caicos Islands right after college and went out there and worked doing fisheries research for Boston University School of Field Studies with conch and lobster. And I absolutely fell in love with diving, which I'd only started a few years before. I became a dive master as part of that job and the Caribbean. I just, the culture, the vibes, I guess you could say, the sense of community, the environment. I fell in love with the Caribbean. It was absolutely amazing. And so from there, I actually got lucky. And this is one of those things I love to tell young kids, especially young girls, is you just have to go with your gut and your passion and be ready to jump when opportunities come. So at that point, I got this random opportunity to go to Barbados and go to the University of the West Indies to do a master's degree in fisheries was what I was working in. So it was a coastal resource management, environmental studies master's. So I went down there and I had to work in for the university in exchange for tuition. And so it was this barter trade thing. And it was great. I was their first post-grad American graduate in the department. And so I went down there. It was, I had a great time. And so again, I was doing fisheries research, my master's. Actually, this is a picture. So when I did this presentation, it was really fun for me because it was like a trip down memory lane. So the picture I said in the left is me this summer. The picture in the middle there is me 20 years ago when I first moved to Barbados and I was working with fishermen doing a conventional fisheries project with pot fishing. But the different thing about this project was that I was working with fishermen and we were designing different designs of fish pots or fish traps. And the goal, the problem for those of you that aren't fisheries people is that these pots were catching juvenile fish. About 85% of the catch was juvenile fish. So the government was looking to come up with an alternative fish pot design that maybe had an escape gap that juveniles could get out of. So I worked with fishermen and we designed different fish traps. And that's really when I started um, besides my education at Ceremies, but really getting into fishing knowledge and the knowledge that these guys had, working with them to design and develop and use the resources we have to craft what we read in literature. And so we did that. And the other cool thing about this project is that on top of just conventional science, I had a socioeconomic aspect of it. We looked at how much money were the guys making, how many of them were in this fishery still, what was the average age? And long story short, we found out that the alternative designs didn't really reduce the problem that we needed. But when we looked at the socioeconomics of this situation, the majority, there wasn't that many of these guys left in Barbados fishing with pots. And the majority of them were extremely old. They were 70, 80 years old. They were retired. And this was more of a cultural, it provided them some money for livelihood, but they were retirees or pensioners. So this was more of a cultural experience as well. So the recommendations of this was to let the guys go and focus our efforts on bigger fisheries problems in Barbados. So that being said, I really loved fishery science, but I was really getting deeper and deeper into the socioeconomic implications in terms of management, but also the local knowledge that could be added to our environmental challenges. And so from there, I continued to work for the university for the environmental impact assessment program. And I was doing all kinds of mapping and monitoring applications. I started learning more about data creation, GIS, and spatial analysis and spatial mapping reefs. Again, this is drones. So it was starting with underwater mapping as well and monitoring surveys, and then moving on to using, at that point in time, aerial images, and if you could get your hands on because it's earlier 2000s satellite imagery. So from there, after working for a few years, I worked, moved over to the Union Island, which is in the Grenadines, um, and worked under a project of the university called the Sustainable Grenadines Project. So this was, this is an NGO that is transboundary in nature. It crosses two countries, but their ultimate goal was conservation of the marine environment of these of this island chain, but also looking to understand and better conserve the social livelihoods, understanding how many people are dependent on the marine environment. There's not much agriculture or farming or any other activities. It's a really a marine based economy. And everybody knew that, but nobody had quantified it. So this NGO who was just starting out really wanted to understand more about what do we have? what habitats were out there and know more about the livelihood implications and the socioeconomics 
as well as a comprehensive database so that when this NGO wanted to go out, the environmental NGO, as I mentioned, wanted to go out and implement projects, they had the data combined. So at that point, I got, I guess you could say coerced because I wasn't really looking to go back in school, but I did love research and I, did, I was living in Union Island and I did love the Grenadines. And I did love this participatory aspect of gleaning and gathering information, which was also a big component of the Sustainable Grenadines Project was collaboration and working with groups to compile all sources of information. So I undertook this PhD, which ended up being a six-year PhD because it was so massive. It was building this marine GIS database. It was transboundary in nature. Nature. So I just threw last minute this little map up there for the Africa side of the crew so they could understand this, I would say, very complex environment. So this island chain is basically a shallow water bank, which is the outline around the islands, if you can see this blue dot here. But this line here is a jurisdictional boundary. So the upper half belonged to St. Vincent, one country, on the Grenadines, and the bottom half belongs to the Grenada side of the Grenadine. So there's a jurisdictional boundary which cuts right down the middle of these, this island chain. And so it's, a, it's jurisdictionally two separate areas, but ecologically, as you can see, the Grenada bank, the ecosystem is really one. The people also socially and culturally see themselves or would identify more as a Grenadines person than the main island of St. Vincent or Grenada themselves. So the people also see themselves more as one unit or ecosystem. So really the approach of this marine database was to use an ecosystem approach, which was the Grenadine Islands and the Grenada Bank ecosystem, and to map and gather all the different conventional science about the habitats, the resources, the space uses, and some of what were the issues or problems using not just conventional science, but also working to gather local knowledge. And so it was a massive undertaking. Like I said, more than a thousand people over the six-year project worked with me to, whether they were contributing data they had or local knowledge. And we built this huge geodatabase that was actually more than 60% of it was based on local knowledge sources. So the other really cool thing about this which made, again, for a great PhD case study, was that there was multiple scales and levels of stakeholders. So what I mean is that there were different types of stakeholders. We had all the different disciplines. The Port Authority was involved. People working in the yachting industry were involved. Dive shops, fishermen, let's say the turtle groups. So all of the different disciplines across two different countries. So they had different agencies, but also different layers in terms of there were different islands and there were different resource users. There was government level, there was community base groups, there was academics. So I had all different types of people that actually saw the environment in different ways, but understood data in different ways and had different levels of information to contribute. So you can't ask a dive shop about, let's say, dumping or fishing, and you can't talk to a fisherman about shipping concerns, maybe, you know, where the, in, the conflict is between the species interaction. But so it was really had to be done piece by piece. So it wasn't like I could just go talk to the dive shop. I had to talk within each island to that dive shop to find out about the dive sites around their island. What we realized is that you can't really scale across. People know about their backyard, but they don't really know about the other side of the country. So it was really great. I was able to test and try out all kinds of participatory approaches to mapping the environment. And I was also, I think, a key part of participatory GIS is it's really an approach. It's grounded in good governance principles, and it's really about ownership, access, utility of information, equity. So there's big, these words that are really inclusive. So I think the other really unique thing was that this data was going to be publicly accessible. And so it was always made clear from the start and moving forward. And this was data being contributed cross boundary, cross discipline, and that it would be available on a public website environment. 
also the other thing that is important in participatory GIS is that you, is that really at the end of the day, it shouldn't just be combining and access to information. The one place I would say that I, I felt like I fell a little short, but again, this was a huge project for all the people on the call that were involved in this. They really know was really that training. And so when you leave a participatory GIS project, at the end of the day, the ultimate goal would be that the users can maintain and use and create the information on their own without you or who, I mean, you as a me, but it, whether with a team or whoever helps start things. And so I was at the very end able to get some IT training from U.S. Embassy to train the school teachers in the curriculum. I converted the whole database into Google Earth so it was accessible. You can see the middle picture is mapping, local knowledge mapping. And up on the top, this is another key point I actually forgot to mention, was I engaged fishermen to help map the habitats and map fishing grounds. We went out on a boat. But what we did, and I think this is the important part, is that in the Caribbean, and maybe it's like this for you all in Africa, we are extremely challenged in terms of capacity and resources. We don't have a lot of money, and we don't have a lot of tech in terms of managing data and whatever. So we didn't have a big budget for this project. This budget was, I wrote little pieces of grants here and there. So what we did to map the seafloor because we couldn't afford back then ROV underwater drones was I got an underwater camera and I worked with fishermen to rig some PVC and fishing weights. And we were able to throw that down in a grid pattern and interpolate the seafloor across the Grenada Bank. So I think that a key point here is a lot of my research and a lot of the work that I've done over the years is working with especially fishermen, but local people, yacht people that work in the sea to uh, understand what the problem is and then see what tech's out there. And then how can we retool it for environmental purposes? So that's really been my passion over the years is working with technology, whether it's software or actual drones or apps on your phone to understand maybe the they're made for another purpose, but because we can't afford it here, it's like, okay, how can I learn this? And how can we retool this and leverage it for a different use? And so that's what this project, I think, really taught me was the importance of participation, the importance of local knowledge, the importance of understanding the social, economic, and livelihood information, which can't be collected many times with conventional science anyhow, as well as the capacity building, the information the empowerment that comes with building people's knowledge slowly, incrementally, building information that's actually understandable, widely understandable, not just for scientists, not our, not dumbed down for the public, but it's understandable for the users. So from that project, the Sustainable Grenadines Project and myself with the Nature Conservancy, we got a grant to do marine spatial planning. So I'm not getting into what marine spatial planning, but as I mentioned, it's this ecosystem approach. It's a way of planning and managing the environment. And it's really an adaptive learning where you're constantly looking at your lessons and applying lessons learned and redoing things, knowing that you, you don't get it right at the first go usually. But you, and so again, working with people to, to come up with solutions and management problems. So these are the steps. You identify your need, you engage your stakeholders, you develop what the vision of this plan. A marine spatial plan, for those of you that don't know, is very similar to a land use plan, where you look at a set area and you allocate zones or space uses so that, like for the ocean, they say, so we can use the ocean without using it up. Not everywhere is a fishing ground, not everywhere is a, a dive site, not everywhere is a turtle nesting ground. So it's identifying hotspots and basically prioritizing evaluating and, and getting trade-offs amongst the groups so that you can come up with a reasonable plan. So again, I was very involved in a stakeholder identification. I was very interested. I'd done multiple, I'd done about three or four of these marine spatial planning projects right after my PhD in different countries. Jamaica, I was working in St. Vincent, also Grenada, in Barbados, in Trinidad. I've done work doing this in Antigua. And so I really love this working with people to map the local knowledge and gather the information. But then it came to the implementation and the use of this data and this information. We were coming up and we were merging data sorts and I was getting my communities to come up with really good. So a lot of the approach I have is also getting the resource users to come up with a solution. Instead of having this top-down approach, 
trying to work with communities after we map everything and say, what do you think needs to be done? You were the chief fisheries officer. Or you were the prime minister. What would you do here? What do you think needs to be done? Because this is their livelihood. They know exactly what should happen. And maybe it's only going to solve 50% or 20% of the conservation problem. But here in the Caribbean, most countries, there's pretty much zero to little enforcement when it comes to marine fisheries and conservation and marine activity. Drugs, we're going to put that in a different basket. So if you don't have that ownership and buy-in from the community-based level, I found it's just a paper. It's really worthless. So if we can get communities to agree to 10% of the solution, we start there, we incrementally get that buy-in and work our way up. And that to me has been my approach. And that is really where my work at that point shifted. I decided, you know what? I need to focus on what I believe are the cornerstones of true sustainable development. And that is to build and strengthen partnerships and people's capacity to manage and participate in the environment, to show people that the role that they can and should be playing and show them how they can collaboratively create this information and ultimately empower them to take action and cultivate not just ecological, but social and economic health. And really, that is the core of participatory GIS approach. That is the core of my belief system and my company. And so that was back in 2013, I actually established my own incorporated company. And it was really the goals at that point, okay, and don't worry, I'm getting to drones right now, was to use geoinformatics and IT tools to develop spatial information and strengthen ecosystem management. The other main objective I had was really to build the capacity. So I started launching out different training classes, not just at the university where I'd been do teaching GIS and participatory GIS, but amongst government agencies, community groups, offering and working to train people how to use Google Earth, how to use GIS, how to do marine monitoring surveys, how to do different practical field surveys to empower people. It wasn't that these government agencies or community groups didn't want to participate. They didn't know how. They didn't have the skills. Nobody had sat down and worked with them. So I worked with fishermen. I worked with all different types of people to gather and map this data for marine spatial planning and for marine management and coastal management, as well as that training capacity building. Sorry to bore you guys, but I think it was really important to understand where I came from, to understand how I got into where I am today with drones. Fascinating. I'm sure everyone will agree. Please. Okay. Because I think it's important to understand a bit about the context of me and who I am and what I've done and where I want to go and where I want to take drones, where I want to take drones, not just here in Barbados, but in the Caribbean and across the world. That is my mission, Kim. That makes sense. Yeah, girl. <laughs> so how did I get started? As I mentioned, I've been working with my PhD and in some marine spatial planning project with the Nature Conservancy, which is a global NGO. And they had funded a lot of the marine spatial planning work and parts of my PhD in terms of the data collection aspects. And so Steve Schill is one of their geospatial technologists that I've been working with doing a lot of this stuff. I was a participatory GIS, but doing a lot of the analysis. So then in about 2014, I think we were working together. Yeah, we were working on the MSP stuff in Jamaica and 2013, maybe in 2015. And drones started getting really hot. And then Steve and I were like, wow, because our big issue was satellite imagery. We couldn't afford it. The stuff we could buy in the islands was either really broad scale, big 30 meter or 50 meter by 50 meter blocks, or the other big problems that most of these islands were covered under clouds or the satellites didn't shoot the water. So it was really frustrating. Satellite imagery, Google Earth was real shady back then when my PhD was going on. That's when Google Earth launched. So when I showed my communities, they'd never seen aerial pictures of their villages and islands before. So that was really where I am. So we're talking way back when in tech. So drones came out and Steve called me and said, yeah, we're going to TNC, we're going to get drones. And we want to start doing, bring them to, and use them in the Caribbean. And we're going to train you, Kim, in three days how to fly drones. And then we want you to develop a case studies of how drones can be used for environmental management, but also develop a drone policy and operational procedures and training curriculum for the government of Antigua, Ministry of Environment. 
And I was like, whoa, Steve. Because at that point, doing this remote sensing and photogrammetry was really expensive, really technical. It would take months to get the results. And I just couldn't believe that they could train me in three days. And I was like, Steve, I don't know if I should sign this contract. And they were like, go for it. You're smart. You're into mapping. You're into GIS. It'll be easy. It's a no-brainer kit. So I was like, all right, I'm game. So at that point, the top right picture, I was like maybe about November of the year. So I think this was 20. I got a drone. So those are my little brothers. They taught me how to fly a drone originally. One's a YouTuber, one's a professional surf photographer. So they are both very good photographers. We all learned together, but they were gamers. So they actually started me. And then I went and did training with the Nature Conservancy. And up on the top right was my first drone training cohort. And we trained a group of people using 3DR solos. And we had mission planner apps. And so back then, long story short, it was very difficult. These drones, everything wasn't seamless and integrated the way it is today. You had your drones and you had a different app. So the mission planning and a different app to connect the time stamps on your iPad to the drone data that was collected. And Jason Williams is the Department of Environment, like their environmental GIS manager. And he is pretty well trained in GIS too. And like we flew this mangrove at least 15 times and couldn't get it to process. It was a nightmare. And so I really liked drones and the mapping potential, but the tech was just not quite there. And it was really expensive. We were using Pix4D. It was like 10 grand a year. This solo was super expensive. And then you needed all this other tech. And it was like, great idea, but not going to work in the Caribbean. So I did actually conduct and put on training course for them and developed, completed my contract. And we developed a great training program. This is in the middle is the first training that I did with Jason. We did that after we were trained. So that was like our first training on our own, which was great. And so then at that point, I realized, as I mentioned, this just doesn't work. This is not going to work in the Caribbean, considering the context that I know in the Caribbean. And I've been working, as you say, with the mapping and the tech and GIS and my stakeholders. And so at that point in time, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of research into different drone hardware the different equipment, so different drones. Because like I said, I wasn't really a fan of this 3DR and DJI. I'd just gotten the DJI. And at that point, yeah, Steve and them were not into DJI. But I was like, this is so much intuitive. This is better. And so I just did my own research. And I spent a good year looking at, and again, after this contract ended, I lost my photogrammetry or my drone processing software. So I started researching what are the other softwares out there? What are the price points? What's affordable? And so I did over from then until now, I'm still doing it. I've been doing comparative analysis, looking at for the various applications. So part of my GIS course and also part of my drone course, what I really focus on with when I'm training is what is your application? There is different drone need, data needed for different applications. There are different drawings needed for different applications. There's different surveys, different accuracy. So it's really understanding that whole workflow that I had research and that I teach. And so it was really trying to find for the Caribbean what was A, easy to use because this was very difficult for me and I was a G PhD in GIS. And if I was really going to launch this across the Caribbean to different agencies and people, it couldn't be so much of a nightmare for me and take me so many hours. So I had to find something that was easy to use, yet accurate and relevant for different applications, but for the Caribbean in terms of what types, what's the cost, what's the skills, what hardware. Now, the other thing that we're very limited on is our hardware capacity, computers, storage, sharing. We also have, like I mentioned, geographic complexities and challenges. I'm working in different islands and even within one country might have different islands. So this rem collaboration and working remotely and sharing and storing data was also something that I researched. But since then, like I mentioned, I worked looking at all these different applications. And so I've been putting on training classes since. So after Steve taught me, when I did all that research, I became a commercial drone pilot in 2016. Whenever the first summer was I think it had opened that first summer I came back to the U.S. and I got my commercial FAA Part 107. And so then I just started doing trainings and 
again, using the DJI drones and using other software, not Pix4D because we couldn't afford it. We started using Maps Made Easy. I started using drones, drone deploy, and it, depending on people's experience and applications, there was different software, different drones, different things I would be recommending. So this is just a list of all the different ways that I've used with my group's drones. We're using it for basic ecosystem, habitat, wildlife, mapping, historical sites, protected areas, using it for managing areas. So monitoring and surveillance, but also more recently, people are very interested in climate change, drones, the implication or the ways that you can use drones for climate change in terms of the biophysical aspects, the flooding and sea level erosion, but also the exposure of communities, the sensitivity of a community, what's the distance to different in infrastructure, what's their adaptive capacity to climate change and adaption. And, and more recently, and part of my PhD really, and more recently using drones as well to connect that socioeconomic information and poverty mapping. So connecting the, using the drone images to connect household level and community level demographic information, and really to better identify the vulnerabilities amongst coastal communities and the impact of different climate change or environmental change on livelihoods. And then Basically, since 2019, I was approached to, by the United Nations FAO, which is Food and Agriculture, and they said, hey, Kim, we want you to develop an agriculture class. And I was like, whoa, fisheries person, but yeah, it's the same monitoring application, I guess. But then, lucky for me, COVID hit, and I got grounded. And so I was able to stay here on Barbados for 15 months straight, and I really dove deep again, Kim, the lifelong PhD student, I think, joined a team into learning all about drones for agriculture. And again, like I mentioned, I don't just learn about the drones and the mapping. I'm really fascinated in the geospatial analysis, the different off-the-shelf IT tools and platforms, the software as services dashboards that are available that make this really easy for people that are not GIS analysts to actually use information and use it to create data, and great information, but also under better understand and have more informed discussion. So again, I've been using it more for farming. I'm going to talk about it a bit of the end and agriculture, but also disaster assessment, risk management. That same Antigua group, after we trained the Ministry of Environment, actually within six months of that training, a hurricane hit their sister island of Barbuda. And that team actually went out with the drones and used the drones for disaster management mapping. So it's really great. And what I love about drones is they can be leveraged for all different uses, all different applications in a country. And so now it's like having one drone team that can do all different types of things is the way that I've moved. And I've moved my drone team at the University of the West Indies along that path as well. Now, I just really want to talk about a couple of the current research projects that I'm working on right now with drones and drone mapping and monitoring. And so one of them is a really big Caribbean project called Sargadap. It is managing and mitigating the response to the influx of the sargassum seaweed that I talked about. So it's developing. And I started this project with Joe Weeks. He's in the, the bottom right corner with me when he was doing his master's. I was supervising him. So we started this, I believe, 2018 using drones. So Hazel Oxenberg, who's the PI on this project. She's a conventional biological scientist. She took on this project to be able to quantify the amount of abundance of sargassum that was washing up on the beach. Why do we care about that? Part of this project is looking at entrepreneurial uses and also making the sargassum into a golden opportunity. So rather than it just rotting on the beach and it being a problem, how can we utilize this resource for good? So Hazel started going out and you could see up in the top right corner and doing these conventional scientific surveys where they were doing line transects and they were adding up the volume and then interpolating across a beach. This is how much sargassum is on the beach. And it was taking them hours in the hot sun. And I was like, what are you guys doing I, when I saw this? I said, I could be flying my drone and I could map this and I could use GIS and image classification to separate out because what another big key factor is that this Sargassum management's time sensitive. Most uses of sargassum 
require that this orgasm still be fresh within the first, let's say 12 hours or less, depending on what time of the day, it doesn't, it can't be baked out. It's got to be wet and fresh to have that bioreactive properties to create whatever they're doing with the product. So it needs to be fresh. I was saying I'd be able to fly a drone, be able to isolate what's the fresh. And then the drone's also giving me elevation data. So I was like, I should be able to create a point, use the point cloud to basically pull out the fresh sargassum, the volume of fresh sargassum and tell you. And what I could see with the drones is they were very accurate. Rather than having this plus or minus, let's say 40% error range from conventional surveys, I could maybe get it down to 5% accuracy when I told Hazel. So she was like, game on, let's do this, Kim. And so I decided to join the team in terms of adding on this drone survey. So I've been working with her and Jeremy's for since then, and we're still working on this mapping methodology. It's not as easy as it seems because the surface model or the beach changes every single day because of tide. The other thing that makes orgasm management difficult, so you can see this bottom middle picture is typically it looks like this. It's just scattered on the beach. Now, the drone volume and other tools are really made more for the construction industry for volume. And so you can do the GIS workflow that I mentioned, and I figured that out, worked with another master's students and we crack that, but it's still very difficult and it's very user intensive. You need to have tech skills in order to do this analysis. And so that can't really be easily rolled out across the curve. But so right now we're working with somebody that's going to try to write a script and automate it and integrate it with the drone mapping software so it can maybe become, but really my goal is what I kept saying is there's already these built-in tech tools. Like I said, I love looking at what's existing in tech. And I said, we could be using these construction and agriculture tools that other people paid for to build and use it for sargassum. So that's what I ended up doing was starting to research that. So yeah, like I said, we did set piles, we use natural piles, and we use software I'm going to show you in a bit to say how accurate. So we did conventional surveys, field surveys, ground truthing surveys to basically, like I said, I'm never taking this drone data reports as is. I always double check it by doing my own field research to see, is it accurate? The other thing I need to point out is we are using 100% off the shelf DJI drones for this with just RJ, RJB regular payload cameras. We're not using expensive drones at all. So this... I'd like to give a shout out as well. I put this in here so I would not forget drone deploy. The other huge thing that the Sargadapt project did not account for was how much does drone software cost? How much they just thought, okay, the drones cost this much. No, as pe the drone people on the call know, and most people that don't know drones don't know, is that the biggest cost typically is this software. What it can do is amazing. And in, compared to what it conventionally used to cost to do, this is like a joke how cheap it is. But we had not anticipated, they had not spoken to me when they wrote the grant and we did not account for how much money needed to be set aside for this drone mapping software to be implemented, not just in one country, but across five and working remotely with teams. So I applied and Drone Deploy has made us a Drones for Good, one of part of their nonprofit partners, and they have given us free software for all of my Caribbean teams for the last couple of years for this project so that, and I have to give them an extreme thanks because they've been so helpful, not just with giving us free software, but providing technical support and working with us to try to figure out how to make this problem a solution. So I just want to say up in the top right, for those of you that don't know drones, because I know there's a lot of people on the call on my end that don't know much, this is the typical flight survey plan that we do. So we've developed as part of this project sorry, I'm going back here, to a monitoring protocol. So it consists of drone surveys where we actually create maps, but we're also taking videos and pictures. We are, one of the subcomponents of the surveys is understanding the abundance. So that is combining the drone surveys with some conventional field data collection to estimate the abundance of sargassum. That workflow and that methodology is being released at the beginning of next year as a user's guide. So stay tuned for those of you that are interested in that. And I'm going to start training teams in this protocol starting at next year. So I think we have about maybe five to 10 countries now that are, we have other grants. So that's why I said, I don't know. So I got, sorry, apps five, but I think we have five more and we might be getting three more. So this is going to be widely launched next year. 
And it's also really cool because we have drone deploy that we are going to be able to host and manage and store all this data on a cloud-based platform. So it will be accessible across the entire region as well as globally. So going back here, we're here. Like I said, I figured out, so this underneath is the ortho mosaic, the product over here on the top is just a screenshot of what the point cloud looks like. So that's the elevation data with the 3D, I mean, with the ortho mosaic mesh on top. So I just wanted to show people the drone deploy software, why I love it so much is that you can do 3D measurements. It's just using like a Google Earth web map, simple, easy to use platform. You can measure in 3D. So like I said, I spend a lot of years researching what I specialize when I do my trainings is understanding what your application is and what pre-existing tools are out there. So I realized for the sargassum problem, there's a agricultural tool for plant health that helps farmers very quickly identify dead areas. Well, the dead areas also, interestingly enough, have the same wavelength or color band as sargassum. So we are able very easily to do an image classification without GIS, but just using drone deploy. Likewise, you could see over here on the right, we are trying to interpolate volume, how much. So this was a great example over, this is just on the peach, about 100 meters from my house. And one day there was a ton of seaweed. It's actually the same picture that's up in the top right. And we found a pile that was pretty discreet. So we cleared it and we used the volume tool in drone deploy and we actually hand measured. It took, oh my gosh, I was sore for days, but we measured the buckets and we found out that the drone we measured and we had 3.84 meters cubed of sargassum when we did our math of how much was on that beach. And you could see in the bottom, the drone deploy software told us we had 3.94 meters cubed. And this is on a sloping beach with someone sargassum dug under. I, we were floored how good this was. And I just think that it's really exciting because what I found out is, yes, we understand how to do this in GIS and we could build a geospatial mar model if we had the money. That's what we need to work on now. Next project to automate the whole thing. And it can be integrated within drone deploy and spit right into ArcGIS online because we are actually releasing story maps and other products using ArcGIS online. So I'm not against ArcGIS online right now. I'm just trying to see what's the easiest solution. So it could be integrated automatically. But what I would love, and when I'm working with another researcher, a colleague of mine at Ceremies right now, is developing an API or an app that will be available in the drone deploy store that anyone in the world that wants to do this could basically download the app and then circle the polygon or the area on the beach down like in the right hand corner and tell you exactly how much sargassum there is. And you chain all the steps. So again, this is not my workflow, just to clarify for those listening, this is not how we're doing it right now. But this is the dream, is to be able to chain together. We have the workflow figured out in GIS, as I mentioned, but to get it chained together and get just an built so that the average person can just go out and fly drone deploy and calculate sargassum real time. And that data can then be beamed out into the cloud and out to the market within that six hour window so that it can be managed in an efficient and effective way. And that's really my dream for the Sargassum project. Before I don't want to go too long on time here, I just want to say agriculture, the last big project that I've been working on, as I mentioned, I was grounded in Barbados for a year and a half and I got into agriculture. So I just wanted to show people how these simple tool, and this is what I just love, can be used. So this is some of the team I was training here in Barbados. But on the left is cotton emergence. So on the left was the cotton, maybe a couple of days after it was planned, September 24th. And you can see, we went back out October 2nd through the same field and you can see the emergence. Now the height of the cotton at this point is five centimeters in height. I actually wish I would have put a picture of the dirt because you cannot see those dots from the image. But again, using these plant health tools, it, it allows farmers to very quickly see success rates. Do they need to replow? How good is things going? Also, if you go down, here's cane. What I learned from my farmers is that really you understand when to harvest cane by looking at the height. So again, right here, we're getting our vertical height of how tall is that cane. So when it gets a certain height, that's an indicator of when it's ready to harvest. Also in terms of problems with canes, turning on the plant health layer and for farmers really quickly and easily to see 
these dead spots. Those are considered gaps. And what they do, according to the agricultural board, is that you measure the gap to see once it's a certain diameter of gap, that is a problem. So again, they were able to identify and use the drone images for that. Down here, again, we're looking at changes over time, just in the field, visually. That is like farmers just love the visual. And then down on the bottom was a really cool project I worked on with the government. So during COVID, we had a lot of food security issues and the government and Barbados here decided we needed to focus more on national food security. So we, they looked to start redevelopment projects of old cane grounds and turn it into food farming. So the Wakefield Farm is a large piece of land here in Barbados, which had been undeveloped for many years. And we went out, we created a baseline survey with the drawings. And we have an elevation map here. And then we also overlaid their farm maps using GIS. And I created shape files. And then we use, and then over here on the right was basically, this is how we allotted or allocated based on looking at elevation and other factors, which crops were going to be grown where. And so now this has become this agricultural demonstration site and a food bank farm for the community that will have subsidized food in the coming years. Oh, and then up in the top, another way they're using for agriculture is with 3D maps and models. And so you can say, what? Farm management, inspections, understanding your inventory and your maintenance. When we did this for them, the farm manager here zoomed all in, found all these issues with building that he wanted done. He was able to count um, some of the equipment and everything. So just having a visual as well as for insurance purposes, if anything were to happen. So those are a lot of the different ways that I'm using drones now for agriculture and training people to use. And even more excitingly, with FAO, who had approached me on this project, has hired me and I will be launching. Again, I wasn't able to travel this year. I've been dying to go, but I'm really hoping it's going to be launching at the beginning of next year. The contracts are signed to do agricultural training using a participatory UAS approach in Dominica and St. Lucia and hopefully many other Caribbean countries. And so really it goes back to my passion where I started in this. It's just understanding, creating useful information and collaboratively, they really were into the participatory mapping and being able to make farmers and local people's knowledge, not just of farming, but also the disaster risk management aspects of it. So incrementally training and building capacity is core of my belief system and my company. And so that is what I was, this is probably my favorite project on it. When FAO gave me the permission to develop a four-part curriculum, combining basically all of my classes, from my intro to drone flying classes to my advanced mapping and monitoring, how to understand your application, to do your site assessment, planning, not just a mapping survey, but what surveys do you need? Is a 360 panel going to be useful? Do we want videos? Be developing not just and I realized too, just doing intro to drone flying, I was teaching people how to use drone safety, how to develop operation protocols, how to use mapping programs. But then, like you said, Kim, when we started this talk an hour ago, was, hey, how are people using it? And that's where, again, I shared a little People are excited. They're collecting data, but it comes back to what my problems were way back from the initial parts of my GIS and Reddit's work is this use of data and information. And these projects and these international funding agencies are funding tons of data to be created, but we are not funding, which is what I started my company to do, the capacity building. It's not that people don't want to use information. They don't have the tools and skills to effectively use it. Like I said, people contact me all the time and I end up having to create the data for them or assisting them by opening up the GIS and creating the maps. And it's my goal and FAO, I'm so excited to do this four part class. It will be to basically walk over a four month process, do you know one week at a time training and let people experience everything from the application assessment to the out, the conduction of the flight, to the creation of data, the managing of the data as well as the production of information using reporting tools, but using GIS, ArcGIS, maybe Earth, and using drone deploy, um, reporting tools. So down below in the middle is a, it's called an annotation report. So that is a report that we 
I wrote a paper this part with, about this participatory UAS approach, which will be released with Patrick McCartney at Ceremies and I in about two weeks' time, is really talking about that socioeconomic map, mapping and monitoring. And that's a case study that we talk about in the paper from Dominica, which is mapping coastal community poverty, climate change, and fisheries information. And so again, that can be mapped just using your iPad and drone deploy. And it actually even has a reporting template. So I have, and again, my Sargassa mo management monitoring program will be using the same sort of a workflow. So you don't have to be using GIS so that people can get out there and do what they need to do and have the drones and the tech as a tool to help them effectively manage the environment. And then, yeah, just over on the right too, as I mentioned, it's not just about drone maps. I, I am totally guilty of this the first three or four years. I was just into the mapping, but just those visuals, sharing panoramas, sharing aerial pictures, sharing on social media. So again, my class and my trainings also include how to disseminate information across a variety of audiences. So you have certain information, let's say for government, but other information for the public. So it's really teaching them how to use Instagram as well and how to use Facebook and how to create a reel. And so it's really, I'm so excited about this class. I just can't wait to launch it. I've been developing this class now for, gosh, two years. And really the next thing is how do I scale this? How do I scale this across the Caribbean? And that's really when I started getting into talking to draw, women in drones this summer and other drone entrepreneurs on how I can take this class and start using online coaching and training parts of it with drone. And this is where I'd love to hear from you ladies is how do you approach drone training, especially in light of the pandemic? It's been a challenge. I don't want to teach it online, but there's certain the intro, especially it's just discomfort, but there, some people do better learning online. And I think there'll always be those groups. I need to train face to face that maybe aren't as good with technology. They just need that person right there. But how do you guys manage it? And that's where I'll end. Thanks everybody for listening. I think it's safe to say that we could probably sit here and listen to you for another two hours. It was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and so much information. It's incredible. And I've never seen an hour fly so quickly. I'm looking at my job for an hour. I was trying to go with it. No. It's so good. Well done. People are like, wait, are we done? No. So I think we're going to have to have you on again. And you have a passion. Your work is developed. And you look for easier ways to do your work. And drones and drone tech and the data was the solution. And I think in yeah. maybe around the world, but I know for our country, we have it flipped sometimes where people are like, oh my gosh, 4IR, we need to get in this drone bay. They get trained. They pay a lot of money for their drone training. And then they're like, okay, I have a solution. Now I need to look for a problem to solve. What's your problem? And I think it's, the way you did it for a specific, amazing problem to solve. Your projects are amazing. I think, uh, first of all, inspirational and just so much technical information you shared. Thank you so much. Mm. I, I tried to dumb it down today. <laughs> yeah, I know. We work with some professors as well. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I dumb it down. Yeah, <laughs> I decided to make a whole little Canva presentation. It's amazing. So get too academic on you guys. No, look, it's, it's so fascinating. So let me just, do you feel like we have to have a follow-up? Because I think the conversation that could come from here is incredible. Basically, share, oh, sorry, save the chat, Kim, so you can see some of the amazing comments. Like everyone yeah. just, thank you, amazing. Yeah, so, no, yeah. There are a couple okay. of questions. Oh, wow. John Mickelson yeah. says, interested in hearing about the availability of multi-sensor platforms that can be launched via drones, spectral LIDAR, thermal. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else. Okay. Every, said, most people were just like, passion, energy, love more, please. <laughs> Good. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm so honored. Yeah. I'm just really excited about this. Like I said, 
And what I love about drones is I always joke when I do my drone trainings, if I wish I had this 10 years ago. Yeah. Because everybody loves drones. They're sexy. Everybody wants yeah. to work on a project. Nobody's late for my drone training the way they were with GIS. And it's like people become kids again. And also in Barbados, we have a ban against drones here. So drones, there's a big taboo in Barbados with drones. Since 2016, we haven't had policy. And so there's a ban on the import of drones. So another big goal of mine is breaking the conceptions, the negative conceptions around drones and really getting people to understand drones for good. Drones can be used in so many cool ways to help us save time, energy, and money. Yeah, it's just to me, it's like drones to the world. We don't need to be college educated to use them. It could be a great livelihood for young people. It's a great tool for nonprofits, but also I've trained fishing associations and guys who can barely use a smartphone that can't really yeah. read too well. So it's just in a tool that is just, and that's why I love drone deploy, I'm not to keep plugging them, but I just love their software. It is yeah. so intuitive and easy to use for my non-tech. Pix40 is great if you're a surveyor and you really want to get in the back end. And Maps Made Easy is great for another type of user if you just want data. But again, different applications, different users. And that's what I just love about tech in general, the advances of yeah. computers. And like I said, that forgassing thing doesn't exist today. And I keep telling my team at the university, don't worry. In one year, that problem and that challenge we're having will be solved because the advances like you've seen in GIS and spatial technologies and computers, it's just, you guys know, it, it blows yeah. me away. Kim, we have a question, Angela. Apologies, I, I didn't see your hand immediately because I was going through the chats. Go ahead. Angela has a question for you. Hi, Kim. And Dr. Baldwin, thank you so much. I guess I, I wanted to ask how your Part 107 translated over into the Highlands. Yeah, actually, yeah, it wasn't needed. It wasn't required. I did it because I am American as well, and I wanted more training or on that technical ends and what was required in the States because we had a ban in Barbados. If I got in right before I got my license, like the government announced, we had 30 days. And I think there was 39 of us that got a license. In Barbados. So I got in right before. And then I got my part when I said in that summer. So I got it in Barbados and then I got my part when I said, but what it does is it provides a, what my team trainings and all my trainings include standard operating procedures. It's not required. I would say it gives me an advantage because there is not many, there is no certification or other sort of similar license in the Caribbean. So that is like the best thing that's in this region. But also I train all my teams. I researched again, not just the tech and the equipment, but the policies when I wrote those first operations manuals. So I combine in the way I teach is a blending of what's required for the Australia the UK and the US FAA's commercial operating standards. And so the develop are the standards that I'm training all my teams and the operations or protocols basically incorporate all three of these procedures and policies. And so that whenever the countries in the Caribbean end up deciding, because many of the countries don't have drone legislation as of yet. Right now we're okay. in Barbados, we're using kite flying laws and radio control model aircraft laws to umbrella drone activities. Yeah. So that, and so my, we're ready for anything. Basically I have really high standards of my teams and standard operating procedures and data management and logs and more than they require in the U S or any of these countries but done on purpose so that wherever the Caribbean goes, we're covered. None of my teams will say, oh no. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hey, when you're doing your mission planning and everything and you're going for a flight, are you guys using ground control points or are you just using, or is that incorporated in drone deploy? I've only used uh, some other software through school. And, uh, and is it telemetry corrected? Um, well? Yeah, it, no, it's a, again, we're not using, it depends. If, if I'm using an R2K drone, we mm -hmm. are using the ground control points. And any of the drone mapping we're doing could be corrected with ground control points if you had a surveyor out there or you had 
the landmarks that are in the ground, like we have these little placards in Barbados. If those were in the image, you could snap the picture in the correct place using the ground control points. But we are not, again, because it's, so again, the, recently I got drones shipped out to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for their volcano and they're rebuilding their pedestrian map. So they are using RTK drones because they need centimeter, sub-centimeter level accuracy. But most of my environmental application, plus or minus a half a meter or less, which is what the Phantom 4 Pro typically, when it's processed, outputs it. Again, this all depends on the cloud cover, satellites, whatever, but it's almost always less than a half a meter. And so there's global accuracy and relative map accuracy. So that's the GPS accuracy. So the maps product is just based on the accuracy of the GPS. But actually the features within the map, that's what we care about. Those are like 99% accurate. So if you're looking at a map of a beach and you're measuring the distance of a log or you're the diameter of the, that hole in the cave, that is extremely it will give you in the accuracy report, but that would be, I'm getting one centimeter pixel resolution and extremely accurate measurements in 3D. So that, but when you're looking at changes over time, that's where you need those down control. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hope that. Thanks for those great questions. That was great. Robin, you had, a, you had your hand up, I think. Go ahead. Hi. So nice to hear you. Oh, Robin, yes. Uh, I miss you and I miss the Caribbean and I'm so glad I saw this talk just today. So I said, what day is it? December 2nd, perfect, I can make it. Really interested in drone technology for fisheries enforcement in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, where we work to do marine spatial planning projects with the Weight Institute. I don't know if you're thinking in that direction or is it going to agriculture? I'm sure there's some application for fisheries enforcement remotely. Oh yeah. I didn't talk about it here, but definitely work it, done work on that and training on that with marine parks and MPAs. So working with rangers in, I've done it in many countries in St. Lucia, SMMA and other islands. Yeah. Yeah. So like that is so something that we're, I've been incorporating again. I didn't, couldn't talk about every application. I've done sea turtles, like I say, climate change, poverty, fisheries, forestry, coastal community, reefs. We actually are mapping, which is another really cool thing that the software is not supposed to do on a clear day in the Caribbean. We're actually able to map Acropora fringing reefs in the Caribbean and get measurements of GPS points of these areas. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. But yeah. Keep in touch. And I think everybody that's on there, if you want to keep in contact or link me on any of these links or email me, I could keep you in contact because I have a few new things I'm planning on launching in the future. And really a part of this, Robin, too, is how can I scale this out and teach this participatory approach using drone mapping and monitoring across the world? So launching this more in an online format so that more people, my reach and people can really understand this and it doesn't just stay in the care. Yeah, I'm really keen to connect you with the Maldives where they are really technologically advanced much more than my experience in the Caribbean and much more than me. I'm, I couldn't tell you how to get a drone off the ground. But even for agriculture as well, the Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture would be really keen to hear more about this type of work for both, both the land and the sea. And uh, yeah, it took me by surprise a little bit when you said you were heading into the agriculture field. I was like, no, give me a shot. <laughs> fisheries. Okay. Yeah, Kim and Louise, uh, this recording I saw on the thing, you guys, is this going to be available on your website or YouTube or how do you guys release your... Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, a Women and Drones YouTube Great. channel. So, so the U.S. Coffee Connection recordings are on there and the Fireside Chat recordings are on there oh, too. So the editing team will top and tail and uh, then as soon as it's done, it'll go up. So that'll be great to share. 
I really do feel like we've just scratched the surface with all the information that you could share with us. I'm happy to share what we do in Africa at some point as well, but I feel like, Kim, this is not the last time we're going to be chatting on this platform. So please feel welcome to drop in any time. And if you've got anything cool to share, like in a bit of a case study or whatever, I'm sure you have hundreds. But if there's anything you want to share on the platform, Shed will slot you in. You have an Great. honorary slot now whenever you want one. Okay. <laughs> Great. We'll keep you posted as I move forward with some of these projects. Brilliant. So, and then... And maybe I mean, likewise, we, I can have you guys host something. Maybe I can host something and you can talk on to my Caribbean people as well about what you guys are doing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. COVID aside, I'll fly into the Caribbean any day. Uh, oh, a whole bunch of us. Will. That's another thing that I've been talking to Sharon about too, is launching women in drone destination trips out here. Stay oh, tuned for that, if we're commercial or not even non-commercial, but just women that want to get into the flying space. Yeah. I think to close that out, learning from all men, having two brothers who always are all over me, teasing me. It was really intimidating, I'd say, the first few years of drones because it is, and GIS, tech, everything, such a male-dominated industry, but especially the drones, the fact I wasn't a gamer. I just stuck to that mapping thing for so long. And it's only in the last year or two, I've really gone more for the creative side, learning more about photography, videography, and... Good on you. Yeah, just getting more confidence more in, in the flying and the editing and the photography aspects. I just was like, I'm a scientist, I'm sticking to the mapping, and... I'm not that good at the flying. I'm not that good. And I threw that one, that belief system out the window about a year ago. And I, Brilliant. I fly almost every day now. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And for so, I, I would, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Sharon, Sharon's notes to you. Let's get women and drones in the Caribbean going early 2022. Yeah. And uh, we have another question and then we'll start wrapping up. Okay. Robert says, <laughs> Can you ask him when the SAO course runs? That is private. It's going to be starting. I'm supposed to start in May of 2020. I believe it's going to be starting at the end of January. I'm kicking off in Dominica and then uh, St. Lucia. So there are four one-week classes. It's intro to drone flying and mapping. Then it's advanced drone flying, mapping, and developing a monitoring plan. Class number three is using, and this is why I love this class, using the drone data to do spatial analysis and create data and information. And then part four is participatory mapping and the dissemination of information, whether it's apps, web maps, platforms, report. And so it's the whole process from start to finish. So it's four one-week classes spread out about a four-month period in these islands. But I know we want to launch it widely. So again, like I said, I'm working right now on building and figuring out the online platform blended learning approach. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. How inspirational. I know we've had some people that literally have just logged in. We're about to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, look, are there any other questions? I know there's yeah. quite a lot of complimentary comments in the chat. I can't see any other questions, but Hi. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew this was going to be amazing. Uh, you've just blown us all away. Feel yeah. free to email me or reach out if you want to know more. I would say to the Caribbean, but to anyone in the world. Because I'll keep you on my list and keep you in the loop and follow me and you'll, we'll meet up. <laughs> we'll learn and, and continue to be inspired. So an amazing way to end on such a high. Thank you so, so much. Let's, let's keep connecting. We're, I'm definitely following you, Kim. I hope everyone else does that too. Keep doing what you're doing. Fly safe, be safe. 